Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I, I can't do it. I just haven't got the energy, uh, the emotional energy to, to listen to it today. Oh, I don't care. There's a picture in the Daily Mail of a bloke who looked old, so I think it's good that two and a half thousand children now might disappear into sex slavery and worse. Ah, there you go. Great. British values. We've got our country back. Happy days. And I'm more interested, oddly, in the broader picture of what it proves. It proves, I think, that we now have a government that doesn't really think it's got any opposition whatsoever. The, the, the sheer cynical, the cynical callousness of just pushing this out on the day of the Brexit vote, sort of casually dropping it into the, to the news mix, is, I, I, I'm sorry that Corbynistas are going to think that I'm blaming Jeremy Corbyn for it, and I'm not, I promise you I'm not. But it proves that the government don't really feel that they are now accountable to anybody. Anybody at all, except the editor of the Daily Mail. And obviously, if, if you have been um, brainwashed by the editor of the Daily Mail into thinking that the presence of someone who looks older than 18 is a reason to ban everybody under 10 from coming into this country, that's fine. I, I, I get it. The effort they've put into doing that to you is so huge that I can't hold it against you that it's worked. Of course I can't. But the government is not being scrutinised by the media, as long as they keep doing these sort of far-right racist things, or pandering at least to that kind of lobby, the media will leave them alone, and the opposition can't land a punch. As we saw yesterday, when Jeremy Corbyn didn't just have a smoking gun, he had the bullet. He had the chalk mark of the corpse. He had everything in place with those texts that had been erroneously sent to uh, the wrong nick by the leader of Surrey County Council. And, I, I mean, it just sort of gets not passed over by the papers today, but it doesn't get anything like the attention that it would have got had it been the other way round. Uh, it, it's an interesting story, uh, and it, it, it is potentially a huge story. The 15% tax vote was going to get a rep referendum. The leader of the council contacted someone who he thought was in government and said, we want to make the referendum go away. And he was um, apparently assured that he was receiving, or he had been assured elsewhere, that he was going to receive the kind of financial help that he wanted. He, he wrote himself, I really want to kill this off. I've received clarification from my chief executive who confirms the numbers you indicated are the numbers that I understand are acceptable for me to accept. In other words, the, num the money we're going to get, you've promised me, that's enough for me to call off the referendum. And it's, it's, it's actually an affront to democracy in many ways, what's happening at the moment. It's, it's an affront to... Um, it's an affront to accountability. It's an affront to transparency. It's an affront to all of the things that we spent most of the referendum campaign being told were important. You know, parliamentary sovereignty. <laughs> transparency, accountability, the rule of law independence of the judiciary, all of these things are, 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 are strangely fractured at the moment. Strangely fractured. And I, I don't know where it's going to lead, but I do believe, and you are more than welcome to shoot me down in flames, I do believe that it is partly because of the paucity of opposition. And yesterday that really crystallised. Because yesterday, I believe, a Labour leader of a different metal, not better, not worse, just different, it, there should have been blood on the House of Commons carpet yesterday. There really should. His best performance by far, because of the weaponry that he had, not because of anything he did, but simply because of the smoking gun that these text messages gave to him. And strangely, it coincided with stories that appear to have some weight, although they have, of course, been denied, that the date for Jeremy Corbyn's departure from the leadership of the Labour Party has been shared with some of his closest confidants. So... I, I, oddly, whenever we talk about Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party, it, it brings out a very strange strand of comment, very similar to the kind of comment that, that you normally get from, from the other extremities of the political spectrum. The, the far left, if you will, if you want to call them that, or the far right, have a lot more in common than the rest of us do. Uh, unfortunately, the far left don't have anyone speaking up for them. So that's partly why it seems so strange to the rest of us when Jeremy Corbyn inspires this almost messianic loyalty amongst his followers. So the question really is, 
one that I would like everyone to have a go at answering, whether or not you're one of the people celebrating today the, the imminent death of hundreds of children that we could have saved if we had somehow enshrined our Christian compassion in, in, in our parliament instead of enshrining something altogether uglier. If you're one of those people cheering, you can answer this question. If you're one of the people just a little bit baffled and bruised by events at the moment, you can answer this question. What should the leader of the opposition be doing in Britain today? Should he be standing up to Brexit? Should, should he be pointing out all the epic flaws in the reasoning of some of the politicians? Uh, Peter Lilly gave a speech in the House of Commons yesterday that, that was almost surreal. Uh, John Redwood claiming that World Trade Organization rules would be fine for this country. Uh, I mean, the, the level now of, of dissembling and ignorance is pretty biblical. And Jeremy Corbyn just sort of waves it through. He tweeted last night that the fight starts now. The fight starts now? Mate, you're... You, you, Ten seconds from a knockout. You can't start fighting now. But that's what he said. The fight starts now. Um, I don't know what he should be doing, to be honest with you. I think if you if you look at some of the breakdown of the referendum, which is just going to just... It's the lens through which everything has to be viewed for the foreseeable future. It's such a dismal, dirty lens, but it is distorting absolutely everything. I explained to you yesterday why... It is the only reason why Theresa May has to really sort of besmirch herself and her nation by crawling up to a man as repellent as Donald Trump. She has no choice. Everything has to be viewed through this lens. And in the context of Jeremy Corbyn, I, I don't know that he had any choice but to put out a three-line whip for the bill last night. Because if, if anyone who didn't, you've already seen the sort of sub-Nazi list-making that's going on and the will of the people. Here are the MPs that defied the will of the people. Uh, even if they didn't, <laughs> even if they completely endorsed the will of their own constituents, they defied the will of the people. Yeah, you, you don't know what else he could have done, really, because these guys need to get back into Parliament. It's their job as well as their vocation. And if you were going to be fighting the next general election, fighting for your seat at the next general election against a backdrop of being somehow the party that defied the will of the people, even though it's nonsense, it's 85% of the British media endorsed nonsense. And unfortunately, you know, you tell a lie often enough, it becomes the truth, as we're discovering on both sides of the Atlantic at the moment. I don't know that he had any choice. And then the... Uh, 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 a refugee announcement last night just sort of smuggled out in such a sort of dirty fashion all these nonsensical lies that are allowed to gather traction because of this media narrative of feeding anger, feeding fear feeding hatred. Do you know there's research today showing that our children are the most anxious in the world pretty much uh, even a country like Indonesia has happier children than we do. Uh, teenagers are, are among the gloomiest in the world. Their anxiety levels, their levels of well-being are the lowest, their levels of anxiety are the highest. They're less likely to feel optimistic, loved, confident and content. Why do you think that is? Every single day they're exposed to an agenda of bile. Every single day we're telling our children, be frightened, be angry, be fearful, be furious, just like your mum and dad are. If you don't believe me, get on the internet, find a story that will portray all brown people. It's just unbelievable what we're allowing to be done to the younger generation in this country. And, and for me, that's where opposition should lie, and at the moment it doesn't. It really doesn't. The NHS story, the NHS travesty, you just heard the worst A&E record ever. In 2010, patient satisfaction with the National Health Service was the highest it has ever been. The cuts are responsible for the crisis. And they do that thing that Ian Duncan Smith used to do, when, when he'd say there are more people in work than ever before in this country, and you just said to him, or I did, there are more people alive. Of course there's more people in work than ever. There's more people alive than ever before. Not to knock the gloss off my listening figures, but I suppose it applies to that as well. Actually, no, because they look at the percentage share. So I have 8% of all the people in the capital who've currently got their radio on at all are listening to me, more than any other show in town. So uh, there you go, that's all right. It's not just the total numbers, it's the percentage share. More people are in work than ever before. More people are alive than ever before. And yet the opposition is not landing any punches. I wonder whether we can actually blame them. When you consider the landscape of coverage, the landscape of news coverage in this country today, where on earth are you going to get the facts about the NHS crisis rather than the, the sort of fringe fripperies? 
oh, it's too many people. It's all about immigration. It's too many people. It's all about immigration. I wrote a bloody book about this. I told you what would happen if we allowed the national conversation to be confined solely to this one issue. That's why we're consigning children to, uh, well, just tragic, tragic circumstances, potentially. And it's why we're raising our own children in circumstances that render them the gloomiest in the world. It's great. We've got our country back. You might be able to get a pink passport. The gloomiest teenagers in the world. Why? Not quite sure. What does opposition look like? 14 minutes after 10 on Thursday morning. I don't know if that I've got a Scooby-Doo. What should the opposition be doing? What should they be resisting? What should they be standing up to? It's almost as if we're becoming a one-party state at the moment. And I'm not necessarily blaming Jeremy Corbyn for that. I reserve the right to blame him by, by 11 o'clock. But right now, I don't know what the opposition should be doing. And I, I, mean, I hesitate to say this, because it could be a recipe for phone-in disaster. I don't think you do either, even if you really like the guy. It's clearly not working. I mean, things are being done to this country that are I mean, almost unbelievable in their callousness. Almost unbelievable. And, and yet, as we see our old people being confined to a lifetime of uncertainty, insecurity and, and, and stress because of the social care crisis, what's happening? Nothing. Make an announcement about grammar schools. Grammar schools. What was the thing that earlier this week about health tourism, getting health trusts? In mind, if it works, raise 500 million quid a year. I thought we were supposed to be getting 350 million quid a week from that bus. You remember? 500 million quid a year, that's government policy. 350 million quid a week, the leader of the Vote Leave campaign conceded in a blog in the Spectator magazine yesterday. They wouldn't have won without that, getting around the world. We know it's nonsense. And yet, opposition, what is opposition? I don't know. What is opposition in Britain right now? Hit the numbers, you will get through. 0345 6060 973. Um, and the reason I said I don't think you've got an answer to this question is to kind of highlight, I suspect, I don't know yet, it always happens during the first travel bulletin of the morning, usually the switchboard goes up like a, like a Christmas tree. I don't know if it will today. It's the simplest question I've asked you for weeks. What should the opposition in this country be doing right now? 0345 6060 Seven, three, is the number you need. I don't know. It's ten sixteen. What is opposition? Is the question, or what should opposition be? As we look at a, I mean, just to knit together three little things that you would think would be starting fires in our country, but metaphorical fires, political fires, fires in bellies. First up, Wikipedia editors have voted to ban the Daily Mail as a source because it's unreliable. <laughs> Second up, the Prime Minister of this country appears to care more about the position that the Daily Mail takes on everything she does than anything else. So you've got this objective news, an objective online encyclopedia saying that this newspaper is not reliable. If you want to why, I'll tell you why. Have you heard anybody say recently Saudi Arabia hasn't taken any refugees from Syria? Have you heard anyone say that? Th these are the sort of stories that are getting traction around our country that are completely bogus. There's half a million, according to the United Nations Council on Human Rights. Two and a half million, if you take the Saudis' word for it, but I'll trust the UN on that. So th these sort of ideas, or the idea that all the refugees that came over last year were all 25. For a couple of pictures of fellas who looked over 18, you check. If they are, you send them back. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's not that complicated. But to ban all the children under 10 as a result of some photographs in the Daily Mail, it's madness. And then that announcement last night, tying in with the refugees... Uh, that, that, to me, speaks of a Prime Minister who doesn't feel opposed in any way. And I wonder what opposition should look like. Christina is in Falmouth. Christina, what would you like to say? Um, well, I've got a whole list of things that I think they should be doing, but I think the first thing and the most urgent thing at the moment is they need to start presenting a coherent um, explanation of what's going on with the NHS because we're soon going to be at the tipping point where it's not going to last much longer and Labour just sort of going on about money um, and it's not that simple and it's not about money but unless people, unless they start addressing the real issue which is privatisation, fragmentation of services, no coherent planning, no accountability for people in um, positions I mean, and of management they, they, they would say they are but they're not getting the message out there and, and, and I have some right. sympathy for that argument what? Labour would say they are? Yes. Well, no, they're not, actually. Because um, 
People need to be, you know, the one thing that that idiot Farage and that bunch did was they worked out how to communicate with people in a way that they respond to. And Labour haven't done Well, that. yes, with, afraid, with, with racist lies, though. I don't think we want the Labour Party yes, to start exactly. spouting the sort of racist lies that your no, man indulges in no. on a daily basis, do we? No, but I think there is a gap between racist lies and um, just not getting any message out at all. Yeah, true. Um, and I think the problem is that um, uh, they had a story. Um, Farage and that lot had a very simple mantra we want our country back um, Corbyn just sort of I mean I'm, I, you know, I, I voted for him I'm not uh, anti-Corbyn but I also was on from the Labour Party as a result of how he handled it yes. he needs to tell a story he needs to articulate things in a way but where? Isn't in the language Listen, you're giving me the what the I'm worried about the where did you see the research yesterday that shows we've got by far the most right wing media in, 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 in the whole of Europe where, where will he get this message out how does he actually well, break through well, um, there, there are ways. I mean, he started he started doing it um, when he was doing the speeches, when he was going around the country. I think he's going around the country is a good thing, but he needs to create a sort of alternative media. Go, going around the you can't. I don't. Disseminating information. Really? How? Like Trump did, I guess you could say. You could argue Trump managed to bypass. Oh, I'll tell you what, yeah, exactly. I mean, if Corbyn actually said something sensible on Twitter a few times a day, people would pick that up. Uh, although that is not the way of getting to the people that he needs to get. But are you not, are you so not, because it's interesting, we're using both both examples of, of, of racist liars in the, the, the homegrown one and the American one. I don't know that the good guys can employ the same tactics because I come back to one of my favourite phrases about it being, uh, today's listening figures notwithstanding, usually it's the case that the people selling tickets for the speed your weight machine are, are, are selling way, way fewer than the people selling tickets for the ghost train. How, how does Jeremy, because I mean, what you're describing is people being gulled into, into fearful, uh, falling victim to scaremongering, but your whole life no, no, is no. somebody else's fault. Jeremy Corbyn can't do that. No, that's not what I'm saying. You're talking about the message. I'm talking about the medium. Yes. Um, and that he's actually not going out across the right medium. Um, Obama did it for a start. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, that, but Obama know, did it because he was he was he was you know what was his book called the audacity of hope. He was that embodied. He, he, I just he was embodied, but also he understood how social media worked. He knew how to get to the people um, and how to get messages to people that hadn't been engaged with politics before. And that's what Corbyn needs to do. You know, if I was if I was head of his communications department, as, you know, it would be quite simple. One, I'd get a kind of simple, straightforward message articulated <coughs> in a narrative form that people can understand that talks in language that means... Just pick things. one thing, like the 350 million quid on the side of the bus, but the Luke Skywalker version of that instead of the Darth Vader version. Well, exactly. Yeah, and explain, and also remind people, you know, that they do have power. People think they're powerless. That's the whole thing about Trump and Brexit. People do have power and people do have influence, but they're not taught through schools. They're not taught in their education how to exercise that. People don't understand what it's be, it is to be a citizen. I'm not saying that's the... No, uh, would you, what would you, how would you respond, and, and, and briefly if you would, because a, a lot of people are waiting. Um, how would you respond to a couple of my texts is suggesting that the country has actually just undergone a right-wing coup? Um, well, I don't think there was a coup. I think it's been a slide for the last six years. It's not, it's not really a coup. Um, I think the fact that Theresa May wasn't elected means you could argue that. Mm. Um, and, and, and yet the opposition, the opposition don't really seem to... I, I, I hear what you say. I, 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 I think you're more optimistic than I am, perhaps, in the belief that you could somehow, in the, in the face of a media that is so skewed now, absolutely bonkers skewed to the right, so much so that people think the BBC is biased to the left, yeah, absolutely skewed to the right, where, where would he go? And you're saying he has to kind of invent a new medium, a new social media to do it. He can't. Another Labour leader might be able to. I'm not going to hold my breath. What do you think opposition should look like in 2017? Michael's in Cardiff. Michael, what do you think? Well, I think opposition should at least not oppose themselves and be a unifying force and oppose from that uh, basis. I mean, I have never been in a choir, James. Um, I can't sing, but I'd empty... What sort of a Welshman are you? Uh, well, exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I'd empty the audience. But if, the, if, if, if you say that the audience in the electorate... Um, they're all singing from a different hymn sheet, different messages, you know, and, and in terms of Corbyn, uh, his presentational style is probably not as, even as good as yours, James. When, when you make that sound as if mine's not very good. Well, yours is superb, James. Oh, carry on. But, uh, no, no I don't, let's not talk about me. Let's talk about him. The, 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 uh, it, the man or the message, you're focusing more on the man, right? Well, because it's often the message, you know, y you've heard it, the messenger, is it the message or the messenger? Yes. And certain politicians, no matter what they say, can't get 
a policy through. Take that policy to another man and they or woman, and they can get it through. You know, the messenger is very important. Yes, yes. And who do you see on the on the on the Labour benches who could could pull that off? I, I, I sort of a lot of these names aren't very well known, but David Cameron was pretty much unknown when he sort of moved to the front of the pack. Wasn't he? Well, they both appeared either to the back benches or to be mayor of a northern city, um, you know, because they've, they've gone. There is no unity there. I think, um, I, I th I'm not very good on names, but the, the, the young lady that, um, or the woman MP that stood for, not uh, Yvette Cooper, but Kendall. I think um, Kendall would be a good thing. Maybe she would, but I, you do have the slight sound of a man who's clutching at straws, Michael, if you'd allow me to say that. Well... Because they are a party of straws, it's easy to clutch, I would suggest. Very nice, and they turned my metaphor around and threw it back at me. What should, they, what should Corbyn have done with regard to Brexit? Did he have any choice but to instruct his MPs to vote to, 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 with the government well, last being night? Being a real cynic, and I'm a real cynic, yes. politically cynic, I believe that he only did it because there are by-elections coming up in Stoke, for example, and he knows that UKIP are likely to take it, unfortunately, and I think, you know, if he hadn't done what he's done, he, he's more chance of him losing that. But that's the cynicism in me. I don't know that it's cynical. I, 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 but, but I suppose I'd throw him more of a bone and, and, and say that he, his sort of hands were tied because the media would have... The message is put out by the media, not by politicians. I was going to do a little thing earlier this week when there was a story about uh, uh, money being spent in China. And the Daily Mail carried it as a story about money being wasted on Chinese pensioners, foreign aid being the new immigration, of course. And the Times covered exactly the same story about exactly the same money and explained that actually this money was being invested in China in the hope of drumming up business that we need to do in order to plug a lot of the holes that will be left behind by Brexit. And I, and I thought, that's so weird. That is, in a way, a, a perfect distillation of where we are. The mail say, foreign aid, everyone gets angry. The Times say, actually, this is, look on it as a lost leader. Look on it as an investment in China. We give some money to China in the hope that we'll end up doing deals with them. And we need to do these deals because of the gaps in our economy that are going to be appearing soon. And, and that's the me medium. That's not the message. The medium there is more important than the message. The Times told the truth. The Daily Mail would have put a lot more bums on seats. Half past ten is the time. Where we're trying with mm, limited success to work out what opposition means on the British political landscape in 2017. It's a very depressing question in a way. Because at the moment it's built upon the premise that, that we haven't really got one. Uh, a thought that crystallised yesterday when Jeremy Corbyn played an absolute blinder at PMQs. I, uh, stylistically he was... Um, not perfect. Why does he have to do the jokes? You know, everyone's got a mate like that, haven't they? Everyone's got a mate. I wonder if you can guess which presenter on LBC is constantly told by his producer not to do jokes. Because it just falls so flat. No, it's not me, you cheeky beggar. <laughs> but he did the thing. I've been reading John le Carre, and I think the R stands for referenda. What? Shut up. Seriously. Hire a gag writer. Get Nick Revel or someone like that to write some jokes for you. Or Mark Thomas. Don't do that. Don't do the jokes. But, but he had a weapon yesterday that was potentially nuclear. And it, and, it, and it went off. No criticism of how it was employed, how it was deployed. But Theresa May didn't just sort of brush it off her shoulders like so much dandruff. She also, later that day, put before the country uh, a rescindment of our fairly paltry offer to help the most vulnerable children in the world. They capped it. See Lord Dubbs this morning, Alf Dubbs, I think he was on with Clive last night. It, it, this is a man who was spirited out of Prague, out of Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia in 1939, was one of 10,000 men to come to this country. And look, I know I could open up the phone lines now and find some person claiming that there are no parallels whatsoever, but I'm going to listen to a bloke who was actually part of the kinder transport when he describes the echoes that he hears and the similarities that he sees between his plight as a Jewish boy fleeing the Nazis and the plight of Syrian children fleeing civil war. He sees parallels, okay? So by all means disagree, but disagree with Alfred Dubbs. Disagree with Lord Dubbs. Don't just disagree with a snowflake gob on a stick like me disagree with a man who lived it lived it and yet last night our prime minister essentially essentially consigned the latter day dubs children to wow well, the lucky ones might end up in brothels the unlucky ones will end up dead and it will be cheered in corners of our country a country that has prided itself for generations 
on its warmth and its openness and its welcome. It will be cheered. And she knows it. And the role of the opposition? We're debating on a radio programme because none of us know what it is. Phil's in Dalston. Phil, what would you like to say? James, good morning. Um, I suppose, for me, the big betrayal was yesterday The uh, you've just mentioned. Because my uncle f uh, flew the film crews into the concentration camp. Oh, God. And I grew up on this anti-racist um, sort of tradition and I feel betrayed I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a bit emotional That's all right, man. Tell you I, feel, I feel betrayed because I think we're better than this and everything that that war was fought for seems to be being sold down the river and I tell you there's a triumvirate James, Yes. there's Theresa May to deal with the immigrants there's James Hunt, uh, Jeremy Hunt to flog off our health service, which my family and my relatives died fighting for. And there's one Liam Fox who's so in bed with the worst elements of Trump's fellow traveling radical Christian financial billionaire lobbies that he would sell his shirt for anything. And that is our problem. No, he's, not, he's, not, he's not here to defend himself, but you're entitled no, to... For now, saying, you're allowed I, to express your opinion. For I now, Phil. I that then, <laughs> but, I mean, I, I tell you, I'm sorry, I think it's quite clear. If you've read George Monbiot, the degree that he's introduced into the lobbying system over there is really quite frightening. And I think what we've got here is bigger than Corbyn could ever be, because what they are doing is they are setting up a, a deal which will change the whole economic structure as we know it of the world. It's going to be coming much more clearly Pax Americana and we'll just have to grab what little crumbs we can. And if people really think we're going to be able to come out of this with a country with a functioning economy, well, they're living in cloud cuckoo land. But there, there is some good news. Uh, there, there, was some, there was some research this week that said by 2050 we could be really kicking but, proverbially, pardon my French, so I, I mean, in the interest of balance, I, I hope yeah. you're wrong, and there is some evidence to suggest that 30 years down the line, when all the people who voted for it are dead, we might be back on a relatively even keel. Well, there's lots of arguments like that to do with lots of things that say, well, through natural wastage, various things rectify themselves, and I, I can see that, but the problem we have is, we have a national health service, which is, which is not going to be able to survive unless it has a reasonable tax base on which to pay for it. And if they stop fragmenting the, the, the services and, and, and doing this sort of privatisation by the back door. But here's the problem. If you were in charge of the Labour Party, what, what, what battle would you just pick one battle and fight it furiously until the election? Because that actually works politically. Or would you attempt to address the various heads of the Hydra that you've just identified, Phil? I think we have to have a, we have to have a couple of narratives going, James. And one is this question of who will control this country, mm. or indeed who does control it. Paul Dacre, if I, next question. Can I, can, I, can I just mention one book which I think a lot of people never read and yes. should have done? In 2000, Oliver Letwin published his Privatising the World. Mm. That man sat behind Andrew Lansley for the entire passage of the Social Care Bill and made sure that went through. Why? Because he, he invited the big heads of all the privatising healthcare companies to his pile in Devon to discuss, and he said in five years there will be no more NHS and they all raise their glasses. Now the point is... Again, I'm taking your word for that. Yes, well, okay. <laughs> uh, it is, you know... I, so I, you I do, I, 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 I want to focus you a little bit. Say is there, is, there is a blueprint here which we have to fight and I think Corbyn has to get back to this thing about these are privateers, they are buccaneers, they are people who've got... But, no it, but, but how? And this is the real mystery, and, and this is really crucial. Crucial mm. for, for our country. All this nonsense being spoken about mm. sovereignty and control and borders. Oh, yes. Absolute hogwash, but incredibly seductive and persuasive. It always has been throughout history. What's really, really important is how you get a message like that out there. How, where do you go? You can't... The Guardian and the Mirror are the only newspapers that are even vaguely sympathetic to what you're mm. describing. And, and they are, you know, a, a drop in the ocean of, of print press coverage. Well, I think the point is now, it's the enemy within. Who is the enemy within? Who is taking this country and flogging it off? 
That's who it is. Yeah, but but, but no, no, so you're right. No, because people have been persuaded. This is like the grammar schools thing that we might talk about in the next hour. People yeah. have been persuaded that they like an unfair system because they've been conned into believing that they're going to be on the receiving end of the benefits of the unfairness. That the only way I think you can get this going, first of all, you have to galvanise the Remain people who at the moment are really feeling betrayed. And you have to galvanise them with a message that you're prepared to fight the hard Brexit. And I think the battle does begin now, but not in the way Corbyn's doing it. I think it has to begin with Scotland. The first thing is Scotland's got to be brought on board. There is the issue of whether Scotland will stay within the UK, because there's a whole rupture coming there. There's Northern Ireland. There's the fact of the whole survival of the UK is coming up for grabs. Who are these Conservatives? That's a question he can ask. The second thing he's got to do is he's got to get the Labour movement, such as it is, and it does exist. There's a lot of people who are really capable of mobilising, and they will come behind a message. And I think the health service plus the, uh, the privatisation and the general flocking off of, of this country, not in the sort of bargain basement mm. met metaphor, but something much tougher. We have to identify who are these people, why is Trump, Brexit and Trump are interlinked. Yes, and, they are. And, and if you can't, if you couldn't oppose Brexit, if you can oppose Trump now when you didn't oppose Brexit, which is what is going on, by the way, on some on the left, then you really do have to go and look, look to yourself. But I think what we have to do now is to, is to get back to people and say, your future survival is based on us fighting this hard Brexit. We've got to stop it. And yeah, you, I, I mean, I don't know how you start that battle. I really don't. Apart from this tiny little oasis in the British media between 10 and 1 every day on LBC, where, where else do you go to hear it? someone as sensible and as passionate as Phil? Where else do you go? I, and, and he carries on like that. He'll have a double page spread in the Daily Mail, pulling him apart like Gary Lineker's got today. Remember, they've already started blaming Lily Allen for the economy going south, remember? That article a couple of weeks ago said if things don't go well, it'll all be the fault of Lily Allen and people like her. It's, it's quite unbelievable. Well, there's another one today. I forgot about this. I brought it in with me. I don't know if I've got it with me, the mail. But I think, unless I misunderstood the story, I think there's a, there's a, there's a story today. There's a picture of Barack Obama with Richard Branson. And I think they've run a story saying that's why people voted for Brexit and Trump. Because Barack Obama and Richard Branson look really happy on holiday together. And they accuse everybody else of the politics of envy. It's quite bizarre. It's quite, quite bizarre. If, you, if I was the editor of a newspaper and I told you to vote Brexit because there'd be 350 million quid for the NHS, uh, your quality of life would improve. We'd be able to control our borders in a way that's different from how we currently control our borders because we don't currently control our borders. All those times you've had to show your passport at Heathrow Airport, that was optional. Just they never got around to telling you. So all of these things I told you, and then within six months I'm printing an article of Richard Branson and Barack Obama on holiday and saying, ah, that's why you voted for Brexit, because Barack Obama's gone kite surfing on the island of Necker. It's just envy, isn't it? They look at well-adjusted, happy people who are at one with themselves, comfortable in their own skin, and I hate to say this, but quite often people who are sexually satisfied, and they get up everybody else's nose so much. All this sort of fury, all this, this envy, all this fear. It's quite bizarre, because the well-adjusted people who are comfortable in their own skin, they're worried about people who are less well-off than themselves. And yet, a lot of those people who are less well-off than themselves are the ones at the front of the lynch mob, screaming for blood, which they got last night, with the news that hundreds of children who could have been offered sanctuary in this country will now run a very real risk of dying or disappearing into the child sex industry, something which the same people claim they really, really care about whenever it turns out that... A paedophile is convicted who happens to have been born into the Muslim faith. Then we really care about grooming and child sex. The rest of the time, forget it. James is in Brussels, appropriately enough. James, what would you... Oh, I'll come to you first after the travel, James. As I, as I speak, I see Jeremy Corbyn's uh, furry face popping up on the television screens. Uh, and it, you know, he's, he's landed some punches in the last 24 hours, but it just makes you realise how few punches there have been in the last 12 months. What would opposition look like? Quite a few people suggesting that, that the... Uh, social conscience brigade, people who, who genuinely worry about the future of the country rather than believe that it can all be fixed with a, with a soundbite and a little bit of mild racism. They have to find a way to bypass the media now. I, 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 and there's a reason why. I, I promise this will be the last time I mention it for at least 10 minutes. There's a reason why the, the, the audience figures for this show have just gone up just exponentially, absolutely bonkers, by far the most popular commercial radio show in the whole of London at the moment. And we're beginning to reflect that nationally as well. There's a reason why. It's because little old me, I stick out like a sore thumb. It's quite bizarre. How much do you hate immigrants? Oh, no, hang on, this is a bit different. This guy deals in fact, he deals in evidence. Or what, of course, the uh, racist liars like to call fake news. 
fake news. There's a reason why. It's because everywhere you go, the song is the same. Down with refugees, down with foreigners, immigration is to blame for everything. And it's such a free pass for a prime minister that why would they bother challenging that narrative? Why wouldn't they get into bed with the people selling it? Because that means you don't blame the health secretary for what's going on in the health service. You don't blame the education secretary for what's going on in schools. You don't blame the home secretary for what's going on in the country. You don't blame the foreign secretary for what's happening abroad. You don't blame anybody, anybody at all. Just blame immigration. Blame it for everything. It's fantastic. Except it's a massive lie and it is crippling our country, both today and tomorrow, and potentially, unless we find out a new meaning of opposition, potentially forever. Now, so three things today. You've got the bloke who ran vote leave admitting that the lie on the side of the bus was what swung it. Admitting it, okay? I, I, follow it on my Twitter page. I tweeted, tweeted his blog from The Spectator. I, I mean, that's huge in and of itself. It's just admitting, yeah, we, we wouldn't have won it without that bus. And the bus was complete. Horlicks. Incredible. The contempt for the voter that these people display is, is, is well, it's unprecedented. Second, you've got the editors of, of, of Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia, not just the, the Herberts who can write in and, and change people's pages, but the actual editors of it, they voted to ban the Daily Mail as a reputable news source. It's just not reliable enough. And then last night, they smuggled through a ban upon the paltry, the pathetic, the shamefully low amount of children that we had pledged to help and look after from the Syrian diaspora. Those three things, all right? Most powerful man in the country, Paul Dacre, are judged objectively by the online encyclopedia Wikipedia to be producing a newspaper that is not a reliable news source, and yet it informs more of our current government's policy making than any uh, think tank or politician in history. Quite incredible. So that's gone, boom, bish. Dominic Cummings, the bloke who, who effectively ran vote leave, conceding that the bus was what won it. And we all know the bus was a lie. And if you want an evidence of how big a lie it is, look what the newspapers did with the 500 million quid that they claim they might be able to raise by clamping down on so-called health tourism, which accounts for a whopping 0.3%, I think, of the overall NHS budget. Or is it 0.03? Doesn't matter, does it? Because once it's out there, we're blaming foreigners, no one bothers counting. They're claiming they might be able to raise 500 million quid a year by doing that. The same people were telling you a year ago you were going to get 350 million quid a week for the NHS by voting in the way that they wanted you to vote. Quite incredible. So you've got the admission that the, that the, the lie on the side of the bus is what swung it and actually almost gloating about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no one believed me when I told them how gullible the British people would be. But look, <laughs> great. And that will be the people that privatise the NHS next. You've got the Daily Mail being adjudged a, a, an unreliable news source by Wikipedia. And then you throw in the refugee thing. And you say to yourself, where the hell is the opposition? 10.54. James is in Brussels. Where the hell is the opposition? <laughs> Hi, James. Yeah, well, it's, it's come to that. I don't understand how not every single day Jeremy Corbyn is not going into PMQs and slamming Theresa May every day on the white paper, on the details. Hmm? You know, every single day coming up with the details. Because no one would hear about No one would hear about it. It would not get reported. How can a newspaper that told its readers to vote to, to jump off a cliff run stories every day about how much it hurts when you land? Well, because if that's all that there is, Brexit wasn't lost because our oh, people didn't have... I disagree fundamentally with the, one of your previous callers that we need a simple message. No, Brexit was lost because the Remain campaign had no details of any kind hmm. to preserve the internal market. At least anyone knows what that means. You know, if it's a simple couple of changes around. Get down to the details. Go in there and say... Right, uh, Prime Minister, Prime Minister uh, let's go to research today. Uh, you, your government has said that you will guarantee research funding for universities, but we now find out that's only until 2020. Doesn't matter. Sorry, mate. I'm with you. I know you're right. You're dealing in facts. You've got evidence. You, mate, you're so 2015. I, I need something more powerful than that. Jeremy Corbyn could stand up and shout until he's blue in the face. Part of the problem is he doesn't want to, because in his heart of hearts, he's quite glad we're leaving the European Union. I think we can probably all agree on that. And the second reason is, even if he was passionately opposed to, to, to Brexit, he doesn't really do charisma and passion, and that really, really matters. Well, I mean, surely what matters to people as well is the details of how it's going to impact their lives. What if you got up there and said, right, have a patient. Lots of patients in the UK, for example, have rare diseases. They traditionally went to Italy or the UK, Italy or France or Germany to get their treatment. What are you going to do now, now that we're outside of that system, how are these people going to get access? Not but, but, but where, though? Because you've got a telegraph, you've got the mail, and you've got the sun, which set the national conversation. Rightly or wrongly, they do. 
And they are never, ever, ever going to put their hands up and say, yeah, it was all a terrible disaster and we're really sorry. So they're never going to cover the stuff that you describe in the way that needs to be covered. But if you've got the right messaging, you can do it. Again, uh, you can't. You can't. Reason. How? How? How can you do it? Here's, here's, all right, I'll tell you. Here's a basic <laughs> message which would have changed the course of the Brexit campaign. If the people on the Remain side actually had the knowledge to go forward and say, Nigel, um, you, you say that you want to, uh, want, to increase, want to cut red tape. Why are you in favour of increasing red tape? Why do you want to leave the EU? Does it make more sense to you that we need 28 different states? Mate, you've lost the room. You've lost the room because I'm going to say we need to control our borders. Why shouldn't we put British people first? But it didn't start like that. It started Damn. off with we need to cut red tape, all the bureaucrats over there. Yeah, but the racists the never admit their racism in chapter one, do they? It only becomes clear at the end of the book. We've always known that, or at least I thought we did. <laughs> Turns out we were actually in a relative minority. 10.57 is the time. I'm going to carry on with this. Jeremy is in Belsize Park. Is it the Jeremy? What, say it again? No, sadly oh. not. I'm the one who said I wouldn't work with Trump. Oh, yes. All right. Uh, carry on. Um, <laughs> sorry if you remember that conversation. <laughs> Uh, we won't book him as a speaker. Yeah, oh, of course I do. Yes, 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 yes. But you, you yes, you, so you run a speaker's agency. Of course I remember. Let uh, me, let, can, can I quickly zip through my list? Because I know you haven't got much time. You've got two minutes. Uh, Take it all. Corbyn uh, has to go because nothing whatsoever can change until he does. At that point, all these things can happen simultaneously. They absolutely need to recruit a successor to Alistair Campbell. And I do have somebody in mind, but there's no point saying his name. He's, he, he's the guy who was marketing director of 2012. And uh, if you remember, they had a lot of opposition from the press. To yeah, they did, yes. And they eventually turned it around. The third thing they had to do is they have to claim back the centre. And um, they do it by doing what the Lib Dems got good at doing, which is being different things in different parts of the country. So they have to attack UKIP in the north. They have to attack the SNP, but they do so by being more patriotic than the SNP. And then finally, they have to, and it sounds like politicians' words which mean nothing, but actually I think it does, and that is they have to offer a positive vision, but that has to include very explicitly the right to challenge Brexit if the negotiations turn out to, in their view, harm people's prospects. And in the process of two years, Things can change sufficiently. But, to but how? Against the, the, ba the media backdrop is what fascinates me, really. Well, that's, that's why Campbell, obviously not Campbell, but that's why Campbell is necessary. That's what he did for New Labour. And, and many sort of dyed-in-the-wool Labour men and women would, would argue that that involved a surrender of principle on a scale that was unconscionable. But 2020 hindsight is a wonderful thing, and power perhaps should be the driving motivation. That was what attracted many people to Jeremy Corbyn, was the idea that he put principles ahead of power. Uh, I don't know that that is quite as attractive as it seemed at the time. 10.59, uh, phone lines are full. Uh, Jeremy's contribution uh, frees up one phone line, of course, if you're trying and, and struggling to get through. I'm tempted to continue with this, because it does seem to be a really important question, and it's, it's, it's if the graph had a gradient. It's got more and more interesting as time has gone on. So the pressure is on you to ensure that that gradient continues to climb. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Don't forget it's Thursday though, so 12 o'clock, mystery hour. Seeing the planets align, three stories that we've, with some success, knitted together today. Wikipedia editors have voted to um, really just abandon the Daily Mail as a source of, of news. I said to you actually a couple of weeks ago, the reason why the fake news thing hasn't caught on in this country in the same way that it has in America is because we had our newspapers doing it years ago. Freddie Starr ate my hamster. Calvin McKenzie invented fake news yeah, long before Donald Trump came along. So we, we were actually formalizing it. We were actually putting it out on newspapers. We didn't need to set up weird little websites and then watch the lies travel around the world before the truth had got its trousers on. Um, so that, that's what Wikipedia's objective editors have done. Uh, and then you have the uh, blog for the Spectator magazine by Dominic Cummings of the Vote Leave organisation, which essentially says that that um, £350 million nonsense on the side of the bus is what swung it. And then you have the announcement last night, smuggled out really on a very busy news day, that, you know, turns out refugee children are cockroaches. Screw them. Just let them die. Let them get sold into sex slavery. We've been so su successfully UKIPed now in this country that we, we'll, we'll just let them drown. Uh, and if you want a justification of it, I'll tell you a lie about Saudi Arabia not taking in any refugees. And it won't go challenged. Those three things all together. And that word challenge. Where does challenge come from? Well, historically, you have an independent judiciary which puts the brakes upon totalitarian government, but they're now known as enemies of the people. You have a media that scrutinizes government, but 
unfortunately, we now have a media that essentially uh, legitimizes government as long as they carry on doing awful things and, and, and pointing at anything other than the disaster that they've led us into, they, they can carry on. And thirdly, the opposition party. Where are they? Where are they? It's not Jeremy Corbyn's fault. Labour, Labour's got hundreds of MPs. Where are they? Well, they're voting with the government. Do they have any choice? I don't know. Think about it. You know, you've got a bloke, actually. Someone's just tweeted me a photograph. A, a, a Tory MP, a former tax lawyer, public school educator, just stood up in the House of Commons and described the Scottish nationalists as metropolitan elites. It, it, it would be hilarious if we were studying it at school, but we're not. We're living it. And the people who are going to get hit the hardest are the ones that get angriest with me for pointing out facts, evidence, and truth. Quite, quite surreal. You, you, the poorer you are, the older you are, the more hurt you're going to be by what's going on. And the less freedom you're going to have to get out of it. What do you think my motivation is every morning? <laughs> I'll be fine. I'm middle class. I'm relatively well paid. Should be even better paid, actually, frankly, after today's listening figures. But I'll be fine. I've got no worries. I'll be absolutely fine. What do you think I'm getting cross about? What do you think I'm getting upset about? The fact that, oh, some mythical Polish bloke won't be able to move? No. I'm, I'm, I'm cross and upset because you are going to get hurt. And every time I say so, you get angrier with me rather than with the people who told you that everything was going to be great. The people that told you you were going to have 350 million quid to stick on the side of a bus and spend on the NHS every single week. And what are those people doing now? The people that told you we'd have 350 million quid a week. What are they doing now? They're telling you it's really, really important that we raise a possible 500 million pounds a year by being uh, much tougher on health tourism. It's the same people. 350 million pounds a week. They think you're so stupid you'll forget all about that. And now you're going to get across about 500 million pounds a year spent on so-called health tourism. How stupid must they think we are? Oh, yeah, we'll forget the bus. We've parked the bus. Let's start talking about health tourism now. Don't mention whatever you do that we're not going to raise any money at all by clamping down on it because the cost of putting in a system that would actually scrutinise this relative drop in the ocean will be much greater than any money we actually raise. Just find me a Nigerian woman with two dead children and I can invite my callers to attack her. Okay, got it. There's one on the front of the mail last week. There you go. Ring in. Tell me how awful it is. Yeah, it's awful. It's very sad. She's got two dead children. But my God, I'm angry that she's getting treated and the other two are in incubators. Christian country. James is in St. John's Wood. James, what do you reckon? Where, where's the opposition? What should it look like? Um, well, the, the, there's obviously a, um, a political vacuum, you know, in the centre ground. And so I don't think, um, you know, an extreme Labour, um, left-wing Labour party can, can fight an extreme right-wing um, Tory party. So I would say that Corbyn has to resign and they have to go more into the centre ground. What does the centre ground look like? I mean, you're talking about Blairism, are you, of a, of a, of a kind? I'm talking, I'm talking Blairism pre-Iraq. I'm talking yeah. a sort of a party yeah. that stands up for public services, but also aspiration and wealth creation. I mean, you know, they're, they're, there's... Because that's, what, that's who they've lost, isn't it? And they began to lose that under, under Ed Miliband for reasons that I don't think were entirely his fault. Imagine a newspaper describing your father as, as, as a man, your dead father as a man who hated Britain. But... This, this needy or greedy narrative is what you're addressing. The Labour Party kind of treats everyone as if they're either needy or greedy, and the massive majority of us are neither. Well, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's like this sort of wave of popularism, and the centre politics has to stand its ground. It has to stand up for something. It has to stand up for the voice of all of the people who are now voiceless in the centre ground. Um, and... and Therefore, I think um, Corbyn has to resign and, you, you know, someone like Hillary Benn has to come and take over. I mean, I loved... Um, I mean, let's, let's, look, let's not forget how great Cool Britannia was. Let's not forget how great Tony Blair was pre-Iraq. I mean, it was fantastic. And it's almost as if the Labour Party, uh, you know, completely dismissed that. So who, who would that coalesce around? Who, 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 uh, do we need someone whose name we barely know? <laughs> I think I think it, 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 it's it's got to be a change of personality, but also it has to be the message. I want to see some passion as well, James. I want to see some screaming at the dispatch box, metaphorically <laughs> speaking. Well, you you think about it. Blair would have totally uh, totally sort of, you know, uh, you know, just destroyed Theresa May at the dispatch box. Pre pre, you know, he would have. I mean, you know, you, you're telling me that the Labour Party can't find someone intellectually intellectual. Yes, I am, mate. I am telling you that. Don't shoot the messenger, but that is exactly what I'm telling you, James. 
They well, can't. It shouldn't be that difficult. They've got like, Diane you know, flipping Abbott on the front bench. Like, I, I mean, imagine how that plays out across the country. I know. I mean, I, I, I can only think that, that, you know, I mean, I think that they're underestimating the centre politics. And I can see the Tories losing 30 seats, Labour losing 20 seats to the Lib Dems. I think you, you are beginning to see a centralist uprising that, 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 that that's going to happen. Without a doubt. Well, I, I mean, I like your optimism. There, there may be a slight change. There may be a slight shift in the in the in, in the landscape, but it, it will depend surely upon the messenger as much as the message. And I don't mean the leader. I mean somebody. This is why the fellow Philip, when he mentioned Alistair Campbell and that bringing on side Murdoch and, and Paul Dacre, you can't. When's the last time this country did anything that, that that Rupert Murdoch didn't want them to do? Well, it's a good point, but I I think now answer the que answer the question. <laughs> Well, I think that, that, that times have changed and not everyone is getting their news from Murdoch and Dacre now. They can do as much as they like, but surely um, I think people, people can, will believe something else. They will believe... But who? Uh, where? Uh, why? Uh, when? Whether? Whither? Wherefore? It's nearly mystery because out. I think, because I think we are a country and we are a world that prefers centre politics, prefers stable politics, doesn't like extremes. You know, but their first reaction is always to go into the extreme, the mirror the extreme of the other, of the other extreme. That's very true. But, but fundamentally, you know, we are, you know, more stable in the centre ground. And I think there is an uprising. I've seen people on protests and marches. They're not the usual suspects. They are, they are voices. It, 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 people who didn't realise that their politics would ever need to be defended. People who just thought that fundamental yeah. decency was yeah. actually a given. And that when we looked at the events of continental Europe in the first half of the last century, we saw it as the actions of people who belong, or, or creatures that belong to a different species from us. And now you realise how it happened. It's always there bubbling under the surface. And those are the people you're describing, I suspect. The ones who've suddenly gone, oh my God, we actually have to fight for the most yeah. fundamental decencies. Because so many people are hell-bent on dismantling them. Yeah, and that's why I think across Europe they have to stand in the centre ground and just, and just not, you know, not, not, not move from the centre ground. Believe in it and stand in it. And I, and, I, and I think that there is an uprising, and I think there will be. I don't like the word uh, uprising. I, I did, that's kind of the, the language of the other side, but I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. It's a rebellion, perhaps. I prefer the Star Wars terminology. And speaking of Star Wars, I'll chuck this one out there again. Has, has anyone else... Clock the fact that every time you watch Star Wars in a cinema, half of the audience were rooting for Darth Vader. How about that for a big surprise and a big wake-up call? No idea at all. It means people watching The Hunger Games were hoping Katniss was going to get kebabbed. It's quite incredible. All these dystopian novels are warning against the terrors of it. Now we, we, we realise you're living alongside people who would actually vote for it. 11.12 is the time. James, thank you. What would opposition look like? Paul's in Filey. Filey. Hello, James. Hello, Paul. My Uncle John had a cottage in Filey. You told me. Did I tell yeah. you last time you rang in? Did I tell you that we had to put five pence pieces in the in the electricity meter to keep the lights on? Still do. Still do. <laughs> still do. Rubbish, you still do. What do you want to say, Paul? <laughs> James, John, to a serious matter. Yes. The Labour Party is now the party of the metropolitan elite in the eyes of the provinces. Yes. You've turned your back on us. Why SNP? Why UKIP? Get out and visit and talk to us. Do you guys know where Euston, King's Cross and Paddington is? Come up to Filey and ask, where are the young people? 60% of our population are over 65. Yeah. Go to Sunderland, dependent on the European car market, and they jump up and down in that <laughs> counting hall. Do you remember? Ecstatic that yeah. we're leaving. I know. Like and, lemmings. Yeah. Mrs. Thornbury, don't patronise white van transport drivers. Get Go and ask them what's their day like. Mm. Either the road's safe for them to come back to their families and get down well, to Well, I, 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 I hear you, and I recognise yeah. an awful lot of what you say, but here's the thing, OK? Uh, let's say that they do do that, and they go up to Filey, and they have it explained, everybody has it explained to them in, in quite dismal and detailed terms... The reason why this is happening is because of X, Y, and Z. And then another fella turns up with a loud hailer and he's shouting through your window, Blame the brown people! What, yeah. What's easier to do, mate? What's easier to do? Well, then you're patronising the British people. You're blaming the media. The Daily Telegraph, the Times and the Mail were around at the rise of the party with Keir Hardy. 
they were against different Bill world Bernard Shaw and well no I suppose you're right the mail were pro Oswald Mosley weren't they hurrah yeah, for the black shirt and, and and the Daily Mirror hasn't got a faultless history but either, but, but right. well no it hasn't but the mirror that, I mean where is people talk about the center ground mm. where, where is it in terms of media coverage where do you go for information but the day it must have been tougher then if you get the working class vote on your side they'll come back they'll come back in droves did you see that drama documentary war um more side get over into the west riding wall towns get over but but here's the problem. I, I, I understand what you mean by metropolitan elite. You mean people whose yeah. politics has come out of books instead of coming out coming out of being on the doorstep. But the people who've put that into the mainstream are complete fraudsters. They are wealthy middle class people who have used it as a label with which to malign those whose uh, intentions are good, but whose experience is perhaps a little a little hollow. Your average Labour politician knows a hell of a lot more about what life is like in the north of England than the average person who throws out the phrase metropolitan elite while sitting on the conservative benches in the House of Commons. So how do you how do you tackle that? So to use me as an example. If I was a politician, I went to public school. And you should be, by the well, way. Well, no, I, I can't, can't afford the pay cut. But I went to public school. I live in, in, in leafy suburbia. Very easy to portray me as being out of touch, despite the fact that I spent the last 12 years speaking to ordinary people every single day. But how do you battle it? Once they've stuck the label on you, how do you get it off again? Well, you've got to get the faith of the people behind you, unless you can entice them back to the ballot box. And how, how then, how then, sorry to talk over you, and I'm late for the travel, or, or, or always, how then do, you, do you, you, you want people to know that you care about their futures, and at the moment, people who do care about the futures of all those people you describe are getting shouted down? Yeah, put this... Try, um, try, try this one. Um, on. It must have happened a hundred years ago. Let's look back at the history. Try this one. Have the uh, working class voter put a yellow card up saying, in you know, in the Rust Belt and in North East England and other places, have they put a yellow card up and say, watch it, you're going to lose us. Yeah. This is your last and final... Yeah, but, 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 but what's terrifying now. about that is that the message that they're already being sold by the Labour Party is one that is, rightly or wrongly, designed to help them, and the people who are telling them lies are buttering more parsnips, as has always been the case, actually, is why you refer back to, to history. 11.17, Paul, thank you. 11.21 is the time. What should the opposition be doing now? And what do they park? What do they uh, uh, move on from? You know, shut up, move on, get over it. Should they be doing that? They did last night. Can't help wondering what would have happened if, if, if Labour had a leader who was just going to stick to his principles and had the same principles as most Labour voters. Jeremy Corbyn, I'm afraid, doesn't. Not when it comes to the European Union. A few people suggesting that if we got a, um, a, a kind of Tony Blair-type figure, pre-Iraq Tony Blair-type figure, and an Alistair Campbell in place, who could somehow sort of tame the new... I don't think even Alistair Campbell... If you're listening, actually, Alistair, give us a ring and tell us. I don't think you could bring the mail across now, could you? Even, even you. It, it seems that they've gone so far down the rabbit hole that, that they've forgotten what day it is. Uh, I don't know, maybe you could. But if you could somehow bypass the media establishment in this country that has become so absolutely biased and skewed that even Wikipedia has now banned the Daily Mail from being treated as a reputable news source. <laughs> Doesn't matter though, does it? Is it? The lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got its trousers on. Uh, what, what should the opposition be doing? I feel really sorry for... Uh, I feel sorry for everybody actually at the moment because <laughs> either the people who realise what a mess we're in and feel even sorrier for the people who don't. But what should the Labour Party be doing right now? Uh, and I want some female voices. Uh, can we just drop a couple of those lines? And, and, and I want female voices as well as male, okay? 0345 606 0973. Jonathan's in Finsbury Park. Jonathan, what's going on? Hello there, James. Nice to speak to you for the first time. Um, I was just wanting to, I was just wanting to say that um, I was a, you know, adamant Corbyn enthusiast when his, the prospect of him becoming leader yes. was, you know, a possibility. Um, not, um, because he seemed like someone, you know, like he's, like you said, that would stick to his principles. But I've come to realise, obviously, with his performances in the House of Commons and lots of other things, he is a bit incompetent in terms of an opposition leader. Yes. And it's also made me realise that this sort of idea of strength being morally neutral 
um, is, which is the reason I think he got elected. A lot of the people that I know that fell in love with him did so because he's got this demeanour of being a sort of kindly, older gentleman. Pacifistic. Pa 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 pacifist, gentle demeanour. Yeah. Well, whether it's true exactly. or not, I don't know, but, but that, that was certainly the perception, yeah. wasn't it? And that he, yeah, won't, exactly. he won't lead us into sort of ill-advised Middle Eastern adventures that leave yeah. hundreds of thousands of civilians dead. That's right, but I mean... But at the same time, there's a bit of a dichotomy because he was also meant to be very principled, sticking to his own beliefs despite public opinion shifts, etc. But he just seems to have completely dropped that. Like when he was a rebel in the Labour Party, he was very principled and very outspoken. But for some reason now, he's just sort of disappeared. The whole spending all day making jam thing and this like drop missed opportunities in the House of Commons. It's, it does seem like he's changed for the worst. He's got less effective. I don't think he's changed at all, mate. I just think perhaps the scales have fallen from your eyes. Might be a better way of putting it. Possibly, yeah. You so might what's, be right there. what's the next chapter? Well, what, what does opposition? What should opposition look like? What do you want the Labour Party well, to be doing with regard to Brexit? What do you, as a as a, as a former Corbyn well, that's enthusiast? The that's the thing. He should have just pulled the pin, fallen on the grenade, taken the hit for you know betraying the will of the people, and just said, "Have a free vote," and then possibly blocked it or at least supported some of the amendments. I mean, I think that, in, in sort of terms of cynical move to appease UKIP voters, it's so basic. It's so very obvious and basic that to, to the point where it's ineffectual and at the same time, you know, costing the country a huge, a huge great amount. Now, yeah, well, I mean, it's just, you, I don't, again, we're back to that, that very thorny question of how you get a message out there in a, in a country where the media is so, I mean, horrifically, spectacularly skewed. So I, when I worked on the Express, it was a, it was a sort of centrist newspaper. A centrist newspaper. Now, look how way, well, that's gone way, way away with the fairies. Where do you go for, for, for straight news? Best newspaper by a country mile in this country at the moment is the Times. But you can't read the Times without knowing that this is how Rupert Murdoch treats clever people. That's how he treats educated people. He gives them the Times. <laughs> Wins elections by printing lies in the sun. Columnists like Kelvin McKenzie still in, still in work after Hillsborough. Matt's in Colchester. Matt, what should the opposition look like? Um, it's a difficult one because I think the, I think the worst, I think if you had a leadership coup now, I think you've got the loyalty of the membership, which is, he's, he's like, he's like Jesus. It's, it's, it's you know, and people are blind. Uh, the people who voted for him, uh, loads of them are blind to his faults. And Not any anymore, I don't think. Not anymore. Uh, I, 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 um, it's, it's a difficult one because I think, again, it's like your previous caller said, he, he's principled and I think the way to go now, I was almost happy yesterday when I heard the, the rumblings that he might be stepping down and things like that because I feel like that's the, I feel like for him, that's the smart way to go. Yeah. I feel like the smart thing for him to do is to sort of name oh, the goddesses. Seems, it seems bizarre. Go on, to, go on, spit know, it out quick before uh, you lose your nerve. Name, 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 <laughs> name, a, name a successor, as it were. You right, know, yes. You know, Corbyn is dead, long live the new Corbyn. Yeah, uh, so that he hands on the mantle. I and mean, they may not pull it off uh, electorally, but the name Rebecca Long Bailey is being bandied around quite a lot. And I have to say, I know next to nothing about her. Yeah, but then again, I think that's what I think. I think a woman would be good, a new face would be good, Some someone who's. Like, you know, not been in the past. I, I, I wonder, you know, I, I think the best, the most charismatic politicians transcend all of these sort of focus group based issues. Because I, I would agree with you, and I was about to say, I think they probably need a regional accent, you know, that, because that. But actually, <laughs> that's almost surrendering, isn't it, to the people that patronise voters and, and, and think that you seduce yeah. them with slogans as, oh, well, find someone with a regional accent, that'll keep the plebs happy. I, I don't yeah. think that's true. You could have someone like Tony Benn speaking from a left wing perspective that resonated throughout the, 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 the more socialist corners of the country, and, and he couldn't have had a more patrician background. Same, I suppose, mm. you could say about yeah. Hillary Benn as well. I, I mean, but then there is a little bit of me that thinks on the telly, in the media, you would you would seem to be closer to so-called working class concerns if you sounded like a member of the working class, which is going to mean a regional accent, whether it's broad co cockney mm -hmm. or whether it's, I think the next call is from Leeds, whether it's whether it's you know broad Yorkshire. Yeah. 
Maybe, no. maybe, maybe, maybe. That's the problem. Sorry, I, I kind of took your ball and ran away with it. That's the problem with thinking, oh, it'd be great if it was a woman, it'd be great if it was this, it'd be great if it was that. I'd say Sadiq Khan won the mayoralty in London despite his ethnicity, despite being a Muslim. You look at it, you just cast your mind back to some of the stuff that Zach Goldsmith and his people were putting out there and some of the stuff that the Evening Standard was complicit in. It was absolutely unbelievable, although given what's happened since that election, I suppose you'd have to say that that was the shallow end of race-hate-inspired politics, and he won despite that, but partly because he kept driving home the son of a bus driver line. He knew exactly what he was doing when he did that. So so maybe maybe the northern accent, maybe the you know, the, the, the son of a bus driver lines do butter way more parsnips than than perhaps we like to think. You like to think of the voter as being quite sophisticated and informed. You can be both. You can be sophisticated and informed and susceptible to, you know, quite emotional responses to people. The son of a bus driver line, that works. It really works. And, and it's not hard to see why. Jeremy Corbyn? Nah. Half past 11 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we're not actually having that much success, are we, in deciding what the opposition should be doing? We've decided they need a messiah. All right? And it's not as if they've got a very naughty boy at the moment, but they haven't got the messiah that many people thought Jeremy Corbyn might be. A messiah has to bring in people... Um, who wouldn't ordinarily have been there. Uh, in fact, one of my tweeters um, it, it just suggested that like attracts like, in a way. And I, I understand what he means by that. It, this notion that, that people looked at Jeremy Corbyn and the people that liked him were the people who shared his world view, which I think I would charitably describe as idealistic. And, and you need someone who makes you want to be in their gang. Do you know what I mean? I think that's where Blair pulled it off and Brown didn't. Blair kind of just gave, especially when he started having all those rock stars going around to Downing Street, it kind of looked like quite a, quite a good place to be. It appealed to the warm side of people, the good side of people. It's very effective, as we know, in this country and, God, in this radio station. If, if, if you appeal to people's nasty sides, you make people feel better about their ugliest parts, that's incredibly effective, both, both politically and commercially. It, it, it's, it's why, traditionally, the, the, the phone-in format is dominated by... Um, blowhards, ra right wing racist blowhards uh, on this side of the uh, the other side of the Atlantic, more obviously, but but we're doing our bit here, and that is the same thing. You put an arm around someone, and say, "Don't worry, don't worry." If you if you if you're blaming women for the fact that you never have sex, that's, it's all women's fault. Down with feminism. You're blaming foreigners for the fact that you're not very rich. Yeah, that's right, mate. It's, yeah, we need to get our country back. We need to put British people first, don't we? Yeah, that's fine. It's the same thing. It's just the dark side and the of the force as it were. So we don't need a Messiah, we need Luke Skywalker. Any takers? Or Princess Leia, actually. Actually, no, we need Han Solo. All right, I may have taken that analogy a little bit too far. Ian, rein me back in, will you, mate? Ian's in Leeds. What would you like to say? Hi, um, uh, first-time caller, as a long-term internet uh, lurker. Welcome, Ian, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, as far as the Labour Party is concerned, uh, the way I look at it is, I think people maybe have to maybe start doing things more for themselves. I think that, you know, we're the opposition, in a way, with uh, radio phone-ins like this, uh, various internet forums, and so on and so on. I mean, I know that there's a limited scope in what they can do in terms of uh, formulating policy and actually changing uh, the way things work, but I think, that's, I think that can still be important in terms of changing people's minds, and I think that's where we need to start from, I think. Um, I mean, it's like, for example, uh, I'm having a discussion with my brother over Brexit uh, yes. over the past few months. And one of the things he said, and it's, it's, it's quite depressing, when he said, people have told him that the reason why they voted leave was because they had nothing left to lose. Yes, little uh, do they know. Yeah, well, there we are. I tried to explain that to him, but he wasn't having it. And I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go into a, 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 any of his personal details in there. Of course. But there are certain things that have happened to him that I think have changed um, the way he thinks. Yes. And I think that he is now believing, not that he, he's certainly not in UKIP territory, sure. but he sort of thinks, well, hold on a minute, maybe, just maybe, certain things could just well be right. If, uh, I know with, a, with a capital R. Uh, here's the problem that Labour have. is: Do they seek to change him back, or do they accept that he is where he is and change their message to accommodate it in a less toxic way than 
than the others are currently doing? Because, I, I mean... I think, uh, unfortunately, I think it's more the latter. Because well, that's I what they're that's doing. I, I heard Dan yeah. Jarvis talking about uh, the, the concerns of his constituents about immigration, and he's just up the road from you in Bradford. T 2011 census, not 90... I can't remember his particular constituency. He's well over 90% white British. So what are these flipping concerns? We're, we're back in Clacton again. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Supposing... OK, um, uh, I looked at... I, I, know that, I know that, for example, you have a beard. Yes. Supposing I didn't like men with beards. Yes. For a unrational... Uh, there is actually a phobia, I forgot what it's called. But Pognophobia. Right, OK. If I had a phobia about men with beards, um, that would be perhaps an, an irrational fear. Yes. Which doesn't mean to say that a man with a beard is going to do me any harm. So you have to look at where these fears are coming from. Well, we know and where they're coming. We know where they're coming from. Well, we, well, exactly. We know where they're coming from, and that is what has to be addressed, rather than saying, "Oh, well, people have these fears." Of course, they have these fears, mm. and we know where these fears are being generated. Yes. What needs to happen is you, you tackle the fears head on, and I think MPs have to be brave and say, "You know what? I am going to take on the likes of UKIP. I am going to take on the likes of Nigel Farage. I am going to take on." Uh, these, you know, the the the, um, the EDL and the um, um, BMP first and so on. Mm. I am going to take them on, and even if it means I'm not going to be in politics for a long time, by doing so. So be it. Because you put decency first, which is what Corbyn was supposed to do. That's what everyone said he was going to do. He was going to put principles ahead of the pursuit of power, and actually he's ended up with neither. He hasn't looked like well, he's pursuing power, and he hasn't endorsed the principles you describe, has he? Not really. I think there was a US politician who said, I would rather be right than in power. And I think you've got to find some sort of middle ground. Yes, I, I, and you could suppose, I suppose you could cast Blair as having put principle to one side in pursuit of power, his critics would, and the middle ground would be somewhere between the two. So you have a fairly clear platform of policies uh, focusing, I would argue, on infrastructure and, and the NHS, and you then also address why the immigration issue is not the key that unlocks everything. It's not the reason why you're not getting treated in hospital or you're having to wait longer at the GP surgery. There's shortages of staff and massive cuts to funding. Right? So you need to do both. Maybe what you can't do is... No, but then, actually, I find that the opposite sometimes is true. And you've heard this program. People ring in, tell me how immigration's ruined their life. You ask them for proof. They haven't got any. Would they go away even more angry than they were when they arrived? Never thank you for pointing out, actually, that's not really the reason why your life hasn't gone the way you thought it was going to go, is it? Because, you mean, you, you don't even know any Muslims. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, still furious. I'm going to go back on the Daily Mail website and find reasons why it's not my fault that my life is rubbish. And tell them their life's not rubbish. Might be a start. Your life's actually pretty good. Because where do you end up if you're telling everybody their life is rubbish and it's all the fault of foreigners? You end up with people voting because they think they've got nothing to lose. Got nothing to lose. Got nothing to lose. Except everything you've got. 11.41 is the time. Viran is in Bristol. Viran, what would you like to say? Um, well, I'm just going to start off with a personal comment. Saw a swastika on the bus the other day uh, and wrote up uh, F.D. Nancy's on my side of the bus because I just think that the rhetoric that's going on for the, by the right is winning. Um, Jeremy Corbyn has failed to connect with the right and the left by meeting them, speaking, speaking with them, and actually saying this is the policy that I'm going to make and take the direction of. Yeah. He's gathered big crowds around Sheffield and all sorts of places around the country, which is great. Maybe we've got a messiah, but we haven't got a leader. We've got a strategy missing. John the Baptist. That's it. And, I, and what I'm just fed up with is that actually, you know, they, before the, the, the national executive meet for Labour, I'm not a Labour voter or any, any voter, to be honest. I have voted recently, but Labour has failed me locally, to be honest with you. They haven't connected with the local people to say, look, this is the issue. Can, you, can we do anything about it? So I just feel that Labour is lost. Um, you know, we do. But there isn't, there's nothing in the cupboard. There's nothing in the cupboard, Viran. I said, I said, Penny dropped while you were talking. What are they going to say? I go, right, we'll fix this, but we're going to have to put your taxes up. We'll fix this, but we're going to have to charge you more. We'll fix... I mean, I guess if they could somehow get this going... And then they say we're going to put the taxes up, but only for rich people. And the right-wing media moves in and says, oh, you don't want to let them put up taxes for rich people, because you might be rich one day. You're never going to be rich, you peasant. That you're going to be rich one day. You don't want to let them put taxes up for rich people. Look what happens with inheritance tax. They suggest... Do you know how many... If you had 100 people in this room now, 
uh, or mm. forgive forgive the slightly grim um, vision, but if you had a hundred corpses, do you know how many of their estates would be paying inheritance tax? Do you know? Probably not, but it'd be quite a lot. Six. You know? Six, oh, mate. Sure. Six people. Six dead people would be paying inheritance tax out of a hundred. And yet by the time it's been through the mill of the Murdoch Press and the Daily Mail and the billionaire-owned newspapers, inheritance tax is awful. So yeah, I don't know how they do it. Whereas if you just come up on the outside, you know, uh, all, all spivvy and plausible and say, well, of course, the real problem's foreigners. You, you, you're home and dry, Viran. You're the problem, Viran. You, that's not a British name. You're the reason why the country's going down the toilet. It's all your fault, mate. Many times. Let me just say this, right? We know who we need to stand up to. The big institutions, IMF, UN, who have hidden behind the closet and messed it up. We followed the US line too much. But that's what the Trump said. No, I mean, you said, I don't know Trump now. Look at that. Yeah. No, no, I don't. The left needs to look at that and say, look, we have followed their narrative and we need to broker a democratic deal between all countries. The good side of what it looks like, not the bad side of what Donald Trump looks like. So we're missing this on Jeremy Corbyn's side. He's too busy looking inside of the UK, not looking outside of us being leaders. That's interesting. And the Labour Party's not doing that. So we've lost, we've lost the direction. There's, there's no opposition at all, is there? I don't agree with, no, with all of your no. analysis but I'll find we'll part as friends because there is no opposition in this country. There's no media opposition and there's no political opposition. Yeah, right, let's just pray it comes. <laughs> right, well, let's pray it comes soon because what happens is it doesn't stop. It don't, no, no one ever goes, oh, that's all right. We're, we've turned away children. I'm happy now. I'm going to stop banging on about refugees. It never, ever stops. It always moves on. The focus of the hatred just has to shift somewhere new. The fury. So where has it ended up recently? You, I mean with judges. The independence of the judiciary being called into account. Our sovereign parliament full of people who have been ordered by the media to vote against the interests of their own constituent. And it won't stop. No, no one's ever going to go. They're not going to wake up one morning, finish their cigar and go, actually, I think we're all right now. Let's start telling the truth. Let's stop scaremongering. Yeah, we, we got, we, you know, there's a few hundred kids dead as a result of what, what they announced in the House of Commons last night. That's, that's it. Mission accomplished. That never happens, does it? Always push. Where do we go next? Where do we go next? Where do we go next? The travel news. And you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where it's been a very fruitful conversation, but I don't know how constructive it has been. Uh, what do we need? We need something different from what we got now. What is it going to look like? Not quite sure. Opposition. Opposition. There's so little of it in this country at the moment. It's quite remarkable. Um, Theo Ashwood, our political editor, is here to bring us up to speed with developments in the House earlier today. Yes, Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, has been summoned to the House of Commons. MPs are very, very unhappy about the government's decision yesterday to stop unaccompanied children in Europe, uh, refugees, uh, from seeking uh, refuge here in the UK. Lord Alf, Alf Dubbs, you'll remember, had tabled an amendment to last year's Immigration Act, which campaigners had hoped would allow 3,000 children from across Europe not in the region, Middle East region, to come here to the UK. The peer himself had arrived in the UK during the Second World War on kinder transport. But yesterday, the immigration minister, Robert Goodwill, snuck out a ministerial statement. Of course, all that Brexit mm. uh, stuff was going on. So he snuck it out, saying the scheme was closing after admitting just 352, 350 children, 200 here, and then 150 will arrive by March. Amber Rudd told MPs today that the government didn't want to incentivise children to come here. The government has always been clear that we do not want to incentivise perilous journeys to Europe, particularly by the most vulnerable children. That is why children must have arrived in Europe before the 20th of March 2016 to be eligible under Section 67 of the Immigration Act. The Section 67 obligation was accepted on the basis that the measure would not act as a pull factor for children to Europe and that it would be based on local authority capacity. I said Amber Rudd had been summoned. Uh, Yvette Cooper, the Labour Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, had done the summoning. She said the problems uh, of unaccompanied children in Europe had very real consequences. She knows there are thousands in Greece in overcrowded accommodation or homeless, or in Italy, still at risk of human trafficking, mm. on teenagers in French centres which are being closed down now and they have nowhere left to go. She talked about clearing Calais. They are heading back to Calais, back to Dunkirk, back to the mud, back to the danger, back into the arms of the people traffickers and the smugglers, the exploitation, the abuse, the prostitution rings, and back into the modern slavery that that's this right. parliament and this government has pledged to end. 
Now, Dr Tanya Matash, she's the MP for Twickenham, the Conservative MP for Twickenham, and was one of three Tories last night who voted in favour of protecting uh, the rights of EU nationals uh, in the House of Commons. Uh, she spoke up to express her concern. I note uh, Secretary of State says the scheme is not closed. I would urge Secretary of State to respect the House when the amendment was voted, that it was never expected to be closed at any point. Does she agree with me that Britain... Does Secretary of State agree with me that Britain should be leading the way, there should be more resources for local authorities, and will the government please consider reintroducing a minister for refugees, not just Syrian refugees, to show the importance we give to this 21st century problem? That was Dr Tanya Matas, and you'll note that she said that uh, the Home Secretary said that the scheme wasn't closed. She did, uh, but then she was asked whether the government would be accepting more refugees after March, to which the answer was no. Uh, so that's where we're up to. Will Quince, uh, he's a the Conservative MP for Colchester, and he's just released a statement saying, as a nation, we have a proud history of offering protection to those who need it, and I welcome the fact that children uh, will continue to arrive in the UK from Europe and around the world through dubs uh, and other settlements and asylum system. And yet the Home Secretary said they won't. Yes. So it's some... Do you know, I, I know you've been busy... There's smoke and mirrors with this. You know, clearly, and some confusion as well. But, but we've been talking all morning about um, opposition. It's going to have to come from moderate Conservatives, isn't it? Yes, it's a very good point that you raise that, that many uh, within Labour are looking to form alliances from the Conservatives. And uh, there is, I think, uh, from those same moderate Labour MPs, uh, some concern that... Uh, they didn't manage to win over enough uh, to support um, their their attempts to uh, defeat the government last night. Uh, the majority on um, the protecting the rights of EU nationals was only it was actually larger than the government's majority. It was 32. The government has a working majority of uh, 16, mm. uh, and therefore, uh, and as I said, there were only three MPs, Tory MPs, who actually voted in that in that voted with the Labour moderates and the SNP uh, and, and Lib Dems as well. So there is. At the moment, uh, a small clique um, uh, of cons moderate, you know, centre uh, conservative MPs, and the problem that the Labour moderates face is that while they speak, while their friends on the conservative benches speak, when it comes to voting, uh, they don't uh, they don't necessarily stand up and be counted with them. And it was ever thus in a way, although arguably the stakes haven't really been this high. Um, in living memory. Theo Ashwood, many thanks indeed. Just coming up to 11.55. Mystery hour around the corner. I know I say this every week, but some weeks it's even more relevant than others. I think we can all do with a giggle. Pip's in Waltham Cross. Pip, back to the opposition. What is it? Where is it? What should it be? What? Oh, James, I'm in such a dilemma, so be kind. Although, on, on a molecular, I am a socialist. And until 15 months ago, I'd never joined the Labour Party. Then along came Jeremy. And I'm still proud to uh, pay money towards somebody who I think has got the most absolutely decent principles. But here's the rub. I know he's not uh, doing very well as a leader and getting the message across. And it was only when somebody said about we need another Alistair Campbell that I sort of hissed and felt inclined to phone. Because only yesterday that guy said um, that it's an outrage about Brexit because we need EU Labour to come over and keep supporting the NHS. Whereas, in fact, the truth is uh, thousands of British applicants are actually turned down uh, from applying to nursing colleges. And now we've lost our you know, midwife bursaries. There's always two ways of looking at things, and I'm afraid um, when it comes to chief whippery, I'm more inclined to be more of the um, Francis Urquhart, and I'm afraid... Right, so, I can't, so Pip, just, just take a deep breath and start again. I haven't understood okay. anything you've said yet. OK, Jeremy is a good guy, but unfortunately he's not able to crack it as the leader and get the uh, message across. And whose fault um, is that? Because I, I, I don't know that Ed Miliband could either. I remember what they did to Ed Miliband. They, they maligned his dead father. Well, I'm afraid it, the responsibility really falls down to ourselves. We seem to be so easily and gladly manipulated into thinking one way or another. And we're actually not questioning or, or pulling up people who come out with these outrageous statements. And unfortunately, I think this is going to be, this is going to be the future. And actually... I'm really worried about Labour because, my goodness, we're in such a tr in such trouble, and there is no one else other than him. And I don't know what we're going to do. And as we are, it's not working, is it? 
important. Well, some, something's not, some, I mean, opposition is important. This is the weird thing. The only people who don't recognise the importance of opposition are totalitarians. And, and you know, you've arguably got one in the White House now. Uh, Theresa May doesn't look like a totalitarian, but she, she is absolutely doubling down on the absence of opposition by doing things like the... The thing she did last night. What is that? That's just throwing a bone to the nastiest people in the in the country. Yeah, and how easily we take it and don't and don't pull her up. Or there is nobody. We're not actually opposing anything. No, and, every, and, anywhere. And actually, I'll take that back. They're not the nastiest people in the country. They've been per persuaded into a position very slowly, like boiling a frog, where they are now actually cheering a decision that will consign hundreds of children to grisly ends. And and slavery and sex work it's just a matter of fact these are recorded facts the numbers that have disappeared from official counts having arrived in italy and greece i i have been mean, tens of thousands of children we were going to take three three thousand and now we're not and people are cheering and i love the people that are cheering because that's how i was raised it is it is it is the christian principle the christian impulse hate the sin hate the sin love the sinner I love the people that are cheering because I think that they are decent people who've been persuaded into a position where they're cheering the deaths of children. And if you can be persuaded into it, you can be persuaded out of it. I just don't know how to do it. Mark Simbattisi, last word to you, I think, on this. Mark, better be brief. You've got 60 seconds. Oh, hi, Dan, man. What I wanted to say is that a lot of the anti Corbyn stuff I'm hearing now kind of plays into the hand of the right, man. Well, yeah, except that it's coming from people who were on side to start with. I, I, I understand what you mean. That you could make a powerful argument to say he hasn't been given a fair crack of the whip because of the media, and I'd probably agree with you. But equally, no, he's not landed the punches that his supporters were hoping to see, has he? I suppose so, but you're talking about that punching duty echo chamber that we've been going around for the last 30 years, man. I think politics is changing. The way it's presented is changing as well. And I don't think the politicians have ever kept up with that. So no, well, thing yeah, thing I, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's changing backwards. It's gone into reverse. We're, we're, we're returning to the to the days of identity politics and votes. Uh, politicians appealing to skin colour and, and ethnic origins and things like that, which is something that I thought we'd moved on from forever. But I guess at every point in history, when you start complacently presuming that hatred has been drilled down so deep into a society, it will never rear its ugly head again. Events conspire to rather contradict you. I